Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. Verse 35. You can see thematically we've been dealing with uh, peace and the storm. And today we, we want to preach from this, this theme today. So please join us in the reading of the passage, verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. They took him along in the boat as he was. They took him along in the boat as he was. And other boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? May the Lord bless us through the reading and hearing of his word, sanctify the truth of scripture to the edification and the empowerment of our soul and spirit. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you praise and thanks for this space and grace of proclamation. We pray now for your power. We pray now for profundity, but simplicity, clarity. Father, bless us with a rhema word. We pray today that after this word has been preached, that you alone are glorified, that your people are edified, and that the enemy would remain horrified because the people of God are unified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I want to talk from the subject, watch God work through storms. Watch God work through storms. We've been talking about watching God work last Sunday. We looked at a sister who was crippled, bent over for 18 years, bound by Satan. And through her struggle, we watched God work. And today, I want to invite your attention to this text, whereby we watch God work through storms. Anytime you see a boat in the Gospels, heads up. When you see a boat in the Gospels, I believe that Jesus turns boats into portable classrooms. There's a teaching modality to boats. There's a lesson being taught by our Lord. But what happened before Jesus cast off to the other side of the sea? Well, he had been teaching all day long. Jesus taught everybody by parable. According to Mark chapter 4, he had been teaching by parable all day long. But he called a huddle of his intimate disciples. And he said to his disciples, that I will share with you and I will profoundly explain to you every parable because it's for you to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. And Jesus taught his disciples the kingdom of God. He taught them about mustard seeds. He taught them about blades of grass. He taught them about how the kingdom of God is expanding. He also talked to them about pushback against the kingdom of God. And he taught them again and again. But according to the text, 
Jesus is there in the boat. Jesus is preaching from the boat, but now evening has set in. And Jesus gives the directive to his disciples and says to his disciples, he said, let's go to the other side. That's all you need to know. Jesus said, go to the other side. Don't, don't, doesn't matter what you encounter along the way. Jesus said, go to the other side. As long as Jesus says, go to the other side, guess, guess where you're going to get to? You're going to get to the other side. Jesus gives the directive, but we must understand now that this is evening time. And for those of you who've heard me preach from this particular text before, you know that in that particular region, you know the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by high mountains. And the high mountains have cold air, but on the bottom of the mountain top, you on the mountains you have hot air. Hot air and cold air, when they mix, creates instability. And because of that, it was not uncommon to have instability in the air creating storms. That's the nature of a storm. That was the nature of the storms that appeared on the Sea of Galilee. You never knew when a storm was going to come. It was difficult to prepare for those storms. You just had to learn how to weather the storms. It was unusual for a storm, as I understand, to happen in that wise in the evening the way that it did, but it happened. I believe it happened because Jesus said, go to the other side. When Jesus tells you to go to the other side, you better rest assured that not everybody's going to be happy about you going to the other side. When Jesus says go to the other side, you better rest assured that there's going to be opposition and pushback when God says go to the other side. So many of us like the seashore of our faith, love to be uh, in the comfort zone of the seashore, but I need to tell you there are risks involved when you go to the other side. I need to tell you, when you go to the other side, you might get some opposition on your way to the other side. But the good news of the text is Jesus said you'll get there. How do I know that? Because he's on board the ship. And so, and so, and so Jesus tells the disciples to push out. They push out. And when they get somewhere uh, on that Sea of Galilee, on their way to their journey and destiny, a sea storm erupts. That, that, that tempestuous sea begins to fill their boat and they begin to feel as though they're sinking. But what you need to know is, is that there are sailors on board that ship. It's not the first time they've seen water in a boat. It's not the first time they've seen a storm on the Sea of Galilee. They've seen many storms before, but this must have been a brutal storm for them to cry out. And listen to what they cried out. They said, Master, or teacher rather, do you not care that we are perishing? Uh, hear what they said. They moved to a point of cynicism. They moved to a point of conclusion. They didn't say, Master, teacher, carest thou not that we are perishing? They said, do you care that, 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 that simply that we know we are going to perish? They had already made a decision. They weren't saying, it looks like we're going to perish. They were saying, we're in the process of perishing right now. And they awakened the master. They awakened our savior. And the Bible says Jesus stood up, got up from his sleep and his slumber. He was asleep because he was Mary's baby. Uh, but he got up as God's son. And Jesus stood up in the bow of that boat and he, he, he hushed. He said he rebukes the wind and he hushes the sea. He says, he says, peace, be still. And the winds cease and there was a great calm. I believe there are three things we need to learn from this text if we want to watch God work. 
If we want to see God active in our storms, the storms of our lives, if we want to see God operative in our world where there are storms operative, I believe there are three things we need to do. We need to look at this text as metaphor. We need to see this text as model, and we need to see this text as message. Metaphor. It's metaphor because Jesus has got them in a boat. And when Jesus has got you in a boat, Jesus is teaching a lesson. It's a portable classroom, y'all. But what is the metaphor? The metaphor, if you go up in the, va in the passage, you will discover that Jesus has been teaching all day long. And I believe that Jesus is still teaching while he's in the boat. You missed it. He's been teaching all day long, but he didn't stop teaching. The lesson continued into the evening. It was in the morning time he was teaching by parable. In the morning time he was teaching by metaphor, but in the evening time it was time to take the test. I, I want to tell you that any time there's a storm, that's the opportunity for you and I to see God's miraculous power. Anytime, anytime, anytime there's a storm, that's the greatest opportunity for you and I to bear witness to the miraculous working power of God. Can I say something to you? If you want to see a miracle in your life, then just be obedient to what God has called you to do. If you want to see a miracle in your life, be willing to take a risk when others want to stay on the seashore. If you want to see a miracle from God, be obedient to the command of Jesus and go where others will not go. The reason why some of us don't see miracles is because we've yet to move off the seashore of life. But I'm here today to let you know that God didn't call you to be a seashore dweller. God called you to go to the other side. What's on the other side? Well, from what we know, there's ministry on the other side. From what we know that there are opportunities on the other side, what we know is, is that there are conflicted people on the other side. There's the man from Gadara. But on the other side, if you keep on reading, as they move on in the journey, there are not only conflicted people, but also there are people conflicted about who Jesus is. But God has called you and I to still move forward and move forth. And I found out when you obey what God called you to do, God will bless you and God will open up doors that no man can close and God will provide miracles and God will apply his super to your natural and when you move when God tells you to move you'll begin to see God open up doors and work his work in your life if you want God to work in your life you got to move off the seashore if you want to see God move in your life you got to be willing to take some risks in your life I want to preach to people today who want to take some risks in the kingdom of God. I want to preach to somebody today who wants to see God work in our world. I want to preach to somebody today who wants God to move in your family. I want to preach to somebody today who wants God to move in your personal life. I want to preach to somebody today who wants to see God move in your finances. I want to preach to somebody today who wants to see God work in your relationships. I want to preach to somebody today who wants to see God work in our church, in our community, Community in our country and in our world. Well, if you want to see God move, then you got to move too. You got to be willing to move and go to the other side. And so the text tells us by way of metaphor, there is a lesson to be learned. When you read this verse, when you read this chapter, and you read this pericope in the Amplified, when Jesus raises the question about faith, Jesus and fear, he says, he says, he says, he says, where is your faith? But the Amplified includes in me. What the storm will show you is where your faith is. And I know you look church ready today. You look church ready today. Ain't no doubt about it. You dress for church. Uh huh. You look church ready. But my question you, to you today is, where is your faith in Jesus? And sometimes we look 
church ready. But when the storm comes, the storm will reveal to us, is our faith really in Jesus? And I'm preaching to somebody today, you think your faith is in Jesus, but when the storm comes, the storm reveals that you put your faith in a person. You put your faith in a position. You put your faith in a possession. But I'm here to tell you that sometimes God will put you in a position where people can't help you. Your position cannot help you and your own feeble power cannot help you. But it's Jesus. Do I have any witnesses here today? In that ship, nobody could do any about the wind nobody could do anything about the storm but Jesus and what the Lord wanted them to know you've been listening to sermons all day long you've been listening to sermons all your life long but when the storm comes can you deal with the storm by putting your faith in the one who woke you up this morning and started you on your way I don't know about you. I dare you to turn to somebody on your road say put your faith in Jesus don't put your faith in this government don't don't put your faith in people. Don't put your faith in power. Don't put your faith in your position. But put your faith in him who holds the whole wide world in the palm of his hand. Put your faith in Jesus, the one that created everything that we see. Put your faith in Jesus, the one who's able to open up doors that no man can close. Put your faith in Jesus. And how do you know if your faith is in Jesus? It's how you respond when the storm storm occurs. See, you can't stop storms from happening. All you can do is respond when the storm occurs. I know why y'all not shouting. It ain't because you lost an hour of sleep. You ain't shouting because you don't even know what a storm is. That's why you not shouting. You looking at me cross-eyed today because you don't even know what a storm is. Can I give you Don Brawley theology this morning? My daddy, one time I called him on the phone. I said, Daddy, I'm going through a storm. People are talking about me like a dirty dog. I feel down and out today. I'm going through. And my father said, that ain't no storm, boy. That's a shower. That's a shower. And some of us, some of us are tripping over showers. But can I tell you what a storm looks like? A storm is something that could potentially take you out of here. A storm is something that's a threat to your existence. A storm is something that can alter and change your life forever. I'm preaching to somebody, you're battling cancer right now. That's a storm. I'm preaching to somebody, you ain't never been here in your life. And maybe you're facing the loss of a loved one. That's a storm. I'm preaching to somebody right now, you are down to your last dime. I don't mean you're down to your last ba bank account. I'm talking about you ain't got no money and you are in a storm. But when you're in a storm, there's nothing that you can do to change it. But God, that's when God shows God's power. That's when miracles happen. When you can't fix it. When you can't change it. Baby, that's a storm. And when you get in a real storm, I got an answer for you. His name is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the only one who can get you through the storm. I think it's, I think it's metaphor because church folk uh, are too comfortable. Church folk want to stay on the seashore when God called us to the other side. Then you say the other side, Pastor, why don't I want to go to the other side? According to chapter 5, there's a conflicted man there waiting for the church. You missed it. You missed the shout cue. There's a conflicted man who don't even know the church is coming, but the conflicted man needs the church. You, you missed it. You missed it. You missed it. See, see, because all we want to do is minister to people who look like us, minister to the people who agree with us. But you know you really doing kingdom work when God sends you to people who are conflicted. You don't understand what conflict? I mean crazy. I'm sorry. When God sends you to crazy people and God gives you a ministry and a word. Y'all looking at me kind of strange. Like you said, well, God would never send me to crazy. Yeah, you were the crazy person first. And God came and blessed you and healed you and saved you. We live in a crazy, conflicted world that needs ministry. That needs the ministry of the church. Needs Needs prophetic ministry and needs Jesus. Can I get a few of us who will be honest and say, Pastor, not only did I come here crazy, every now and then I'm still crazy, but I thank God, God keeps me and God blesses me. Don't look at me cross-eyed. Some of us will be honest about it. I'm still crazy but I thank God that God is healing me. God is keeping me. God is blessing me. God is... Do I have any witnesses here today? Is there anybody that no 
know something about crazy. Conflicted people on the other side, but not only conflicted people, people conflicted. Chapter 6 of Mark's gospel, Jesus goes to Nazareth on the journey, on the journey of ministry, and, and the people from which he came from, Nazareth, rejected him. And Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own kin. Not only do you have conflicted people, you got people conflicted about who Jesus is. The reason for the storm is to help believers sometimes understand in a deeper way who Jesus is to you. Because the world in which we live does not embrace the Jesus we serve. And you can't go to the world to shore up your theology. You got to know for yourself who Jesus is. Do I have anybody who knows what I'm talking about? Before you go to work tomorrow, you better make up your mind you know who Jesus is. You, you talk about, I'm going to go to work and try to find Jesus. You better bring Jesus with you. When you go to work, don't go and find Jesus. Bring Jesus with you. Uh, get, get, get clear on who Jesus is in your life. I, I wonder, is there anybody here today, after a couple of storms in your life, you are clear on who Jesus is? Is there anybody who's ever been, ever been in a storm and now you can say with a certainty, you know who Jesus is. You know for yourself, your mama may have, your papa may have, but God bless the child who knows for certain who Jesus is. And I'm talking about a Jesus who understands your trials and tribulations. I'm talking about a Jesus who is there in the midnight hour. I'm talking about a Jesus who knows something about, uh, about being oppressed. I'm I'm talking about a Jesus who understands black people. I'm talking about a Jesus who looks like us. I'm talking about a Jesus. Y'all ain't going to help me preach this. I'm talking about the biblical Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus who had hair like lamb's wool and feet like burnished brass. I'm talking about Jesus who saw our ancestors through. The same Jesus is seeing me through and seeing you through as well. I believe not only is it metaphor, but there's a model in this message, in this passage. What do you mean, Pastor? Look at what happens when they wake Jesus. I struggle with this because in my humanness, if it were me, I probably would have done many of the same things the disciples did. I would have woke, I would have wakened them too. Jesus, wake up. You the one who said, go to the other side. You don't want to want to go out here in the evening. I'm following you. And you sleep. I'd have, I'd have shown up, woke him up too. I don't know about y'all. Some of y'all so holy. Y'all wouldn't know. I'd have woke him up too. Jesus, wake up. Wake up. And, and I struggled, Zandra, because I, I wanted to know, was Jesus uh, being critical and chastising the disciples for waking him up? What was it? Because I believe in their humanness, they had a right to wake him up. As a matter of fact, Jesus, I mean, why are you sleep in the first place? Everybody else trying to row. Everybody else trying to get through this storm. What you sleeping for? Jesus, get up. We need you to do something. And here's what I picked up in the text. Jesus was not angry at them for waking him up. Because you can't stop storms. What Jesus was critiquing was their reaction to the storm. Too much had been invested in the disciples for them to panic now. Come here, somebody. Come here, come here, come here, come here. You have too much of a history with God to panic in this storm. You've been through too much with God to panic in this storm. You've seen too much in your life for you to panic in this storm. I dare somebody to speak back to the storm and say, I ain't going to panic now. I've, been, I've seen some storms in my life, and I'm not going to panic now. I'm not going to allow my life to be ruled by fear. I'm not going to live in fear because God's got too much for me, for me to live my life shackled by fear. Let me preach to somebody today. You need to, you need to let go of the fear and embrace the faith you have in Jesus. 
as long as Jesus is on board the ship can I give you a little bit of your own history I don't even know your story but if you're here today you're here today because God blessed you to be here today if you're here today it's because you survived some storms if you're here today it's because God was with you take a praise break if you wanna and give God some praise for seeing you through the storm being with you on the ship if he's been with you that's how you made it I believe the model I believe the model is here Jesus is modeling for disciples how to watch God work in a storm go to sleep you don't believe me go to sleep why overreact to this storm why not put your trust in Jesus who's on the ship go to sleep okay um, alright you didn't get it uh, let me do it this way let me do it this way let me, let me, walk, let me work backwards um, why are the disciples overreacting to this storm they've heard parabolic teaching they have watched and witnessed divine miracles. They watched divine miracles in the life of Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever. And they did not have antibiotics, but they had the Almighty. And Jesus dried up the fever. They saw, they saw, they saw a leper, a leper cleansed by the power of God. They saw, they saw a man uh, on the Sabbath day in the temple with a withered hand. But Jesus restored his hand like the other on the Sabbath day. And I wanted to know with all of that teaching and all those miracles, why were they overreacting to the storm? And the Spirit said, this is the first time when they were with Jesus, they saw some water get in their boat. And I came to tell you today, if you keep on following Jesus, some water is going to get in your boat. You didn't hear what I said. There is some water coming, y'all. There are some winds and some waves coming, and water will eventually get in your boat. But that's why when you come to church, you need to pay careful attention to the miracle-working power of God in somebody else's storm. Because when you see God do something in somebody else's life, you need to make make a record of it because if he did it for them do I have a witness I serve a God that'll do it for you come here jewels do I have any witnesses here today do I have any emeralds in the house today do I have any black diamonds in the house do I do I do I have any amethyst in the house do I do I have any black diamonds in the house do I have any sapphires in the house do I have any rubies in the house all y'all need to be quiet and hear the parados testify parados will tell you something if you make it from generation to generation some water will get in your boat but when the water gets in your boat don't trip baby there's a savior there's a life preserver on the boat and his name is Jesus do I have any paradox who can testify well if I don't have any can I get some rubies who can look back over your life and say I've gotten some water in my boat and some of the water just got in my boat some of the water I messed up and I, I made I made it get in the boat and the water got there but it didn't drown me because I serve a God who can preserve me when water gets in my boat. Do I have, do I have any sapphires in the house who can testify to a black diamond? Don't worry, baby. The water will get in the boat every now and then. But water in the boat doesn't mean that your life is over. Water in the boat doesn't mean that it's going to end right here. We serve a God who can get you to the other side with water in the boat. Do I have any witnesses? here today anybody know anything about having problems in your life but you're still making it anybody know anything about drama in your life but you're still here anybody know anything about issues in your world but you're still making it by the power of God God proves to you who God is God blesses you to make it to the other side even when you got some water in your boat stop hiding it testify I know I got water in my boat but the water didn't stop me me from being in church this morning the water didn't stop me from praising God this morning the water didn't stop me from having a testimony are there any jewels with water in your boat but God in your life come on and give God the praise if you got 
water in the boat, but God in your life. Don't overreact to the water, but praise God for being in the boat. I believe the model, and I'm gonna, Reverend Lewis almost preached my sermon before in the prayer. He almost left me nothing to preach. Jesus, some commentators point out that when Jesus rebuked the storm and still the sea, some point out the way he rebuked the storm was the same way he exercised demons. Some storms just happen in the course of life. But some storms, I'm suspicious. Some storms, the devil in that storm. There's some dem something demonic about that storm. And can I tell you something? It, 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 it's, it's, going, it's going to sound like I'm telling you to do something that's a little unnatural. But I need you to think theologically with me. If you're going where God wants you to go, you need to expect the enemy to show up with opposition. And, and some of us come to church, we're pouting about opposition in our lives. What you, want to need, what you really need to do is think of the opposition as confirmation. And you need to start shouting. When people are hating, start shouting. When things are breaking out, can I be honest with some of the stuff going on in your life right now is not natural. Some of it is demonic opposition because the enemy knows if you ever make it to the other side, if you ever make it to your destiny, if you ever make it to where God wants you to be, ain't going to be no stopping you. So that's why you got opposition. So I dare you in faith to shout in the face of opposition and say, go ahead. I'm still going to make it with water in my boat. Go ahead. I'm still going to make it to the other side. Not because of me, but look who's with me in the boat. His name is Jesus, and he said it. Ah. Woo! Y'all missed the shell cue. I'm preaching to somebody right now. You need to stop giving the devil so much credit and so much authority over your life and begin to thank God for Jesus being on your boat. This is your praise cue. This is your moment right now to thank God. You are going to the other side. No matter the opposition, God will bring you through. Raquel Gill, I think she's one of my daughters in ministry. I claim her that way. She coming back to preach for us during Holy Week. I know she's my daughter because every time I ask her to come preach, she come back. Do you remember her first sermon? She preached on this story, and I'll never forget what she said. I think there's a model for all believers who want to see God work miraculously through storms. She said, note the order. Jesus rebuked the storm, then he declared peace. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. That was too deep. Let me come back and get you. The reason why, the reason why our world is out of order is we declare peace without rebuking. You need to stop blessing everything. Some things need to be rebuked in Jesus' name some foolishness in your life and in your world, you need to stand up in the authority that God has given. And I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That mess ain't of God. I don't receive it. Stop receiving everything that everybody gives you, everything everybody's. Some stuff ain't of God. What you need to do is rebuke. Y'all looking at me kind of strange. You need to stand up in authority and follow the model of Jesus. Some things in our world need to be rebuked in Jesus' name. We want peace. You ain't gonna ever have peace peace in the world until you stand in your authority church you got to stand up and declare in the face of evil we rebuke you in the name of Jesus and the Bible says when Jesus rebuked the storm it stopped right there because the storm knows who the master is don't you stand in your own power when you stand up stand up in the name of Jesus and declare I rebuke you in the name of Jesus storm cease in my life storm you don't have the authority over my life
And the problem with our world is we want peace, but we don't want to rebuke anything. I believe the model from Jesus, if you want to see God's miraculous power in the storm, you need to rebuke some things. Can I? This is St. Paul, so let me just, I rebuke racism in the name of Jesus. And the problem with some of us, elders, y'all pray for me. The problem with some of us is we want peace Race, race relations, we want peace, but we don't want to rebuke anything. We don't, we, want to, we, we don't want to stand up against systemic racism and racistic policies. We just want to get along with everybody. But I heard the preacher while he was praying say, peace means nothing missing and nothing broken. Well, if you're going to have nothing missing, nothing broken, you got to stand up and you have to put a demand on power. You have to be willing to stand up to the evils of our world and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. When the church stands up and rebukes and rebukes racism and rebukes misogynistic practices and rebukes, y'all ain't going to say nothing, paternalistic policies and, and, and when we rebuke hierarchical structures and when we stand in the authority in which God has called us to, yes you're going to run up against conflicted people yes you're going to run up against crazy people but when you stand in the power of God that's the only way you will see peace in our world as a matter of fact the reason why some of y'all ain't shouting some of y'all are really comfortable with confusion and I come down I come in the name of Jesus I rebuke that foolishness in the name of some of y'all every time the church get calm you got to run around start a rumor because you, you ain't comfortable with peace you ain't comfortable when it, but I come in the name of Jesus. I rebuke all confusion. I rebuke confusion in this house. I rebuke confusion over your life in the name of Jesus. I declare peace after the rebuke. Is there anybody here today that wants some peace in your life? Is there anybody here today who wants some calm in your life? Some of us are so used to crazy that we don't even want calm in our lives. Last, lastly, and I'm through. I believe if you want to see the miraculous power of God in the midst of the storm, I think you need to see this as metaphor. I think you need to see this as model. But Jules, you got to hear the message. You got to hear the message. I, I think the message to the disciples and to the church and to all those who would follow Jesus is that no matter the storm, always remember before you panic Jesus is on board the ship. That's the message. And we're preaching from a Sankofa lens. I don't know. I may have made that up, but it's a Sankofa lens. I, I, think, I think what we need to do, um, the, uh, the Akan, Twi language, uh, Sankofa means to look back, to go back and get it so that you can move forward with your life. And I believe what Jesus was saying to the disciples on that boat is go back and get it. Go back and get all that I taught you. Go back and get all that I showed you because we're heading to the other side. You missed it. This is a Sankofa moment, St. Paul. Go back. Go back in our history and see what God has done because God is not finished with us yet. God's got some more for us to do and I believe that God's calling us to the other side. There may be conflict over there, but the only way you're going to deal with that, you can't live in fear. You got to go back and get it. Tell your neighbor, go get it. Go back and get the stories. Go back and get the testimonies. Go back and get the witness. Go back and get the teaching. God has said enough and God has done enough in you right now for you to make to the other side. God has done enough in you and God has revealed enough in you for you to stop panicking and tripping and, and acting crazy. God has done enough for you and in you for you to make it in the present and move forward with your future. And I believe today that one of the ways we can make it is we look back and see what God has done in the life of some jewels. We'll be able to move forward with our lives. You say, well, preacher, our, our world today is going through an educational storm. I read somewhere that over $20 billion dollars of resources go to white children that never make it to black children. But yet we're expected to pass the same test with less resources. But black people, y'all, y'all know we know something about having less and doing more. Do I have any witnesses here today? We know something about having less and still getting more done. 
Here it is. I'm preaching at the St. Paul Community Baptist Church, and we are located in East New York, and we're considered to be in one of the poorest neighborhoods of all of New York City. But I'm sitting in a glorious sanctuary, and I'm sitting here not because the government has funded this church, but because people who know how to do more with less have come together in the name of Jesus to build 5,000 homes in our community, and people who know how to do more with less have built a church and a charter school for their children and I know a church that knows how to do more with less even when we don't have money we still have fellowship I know a church that knows that it's not about how much money you have but sometimes it's about the quality of the love and the relationships you share I know some sisters who know I may not have all the money in the world but I got sisterhood and as long as I got my sisters I know I'm going to be alright I'm preaching to somebody that knows black people we've always been able to do more with less. The Sankofa moment, Mary McLeod Bethune knew something about doing more with less. She knew that those who oppress our people will not liberate our people. And so she opened up her own school, began to educate our children began and founded United Negro College Fund. Yes, yeah, yes, she did. And, and she, she, she kept on to the point that she was regarded in our nation as a liberator of our people. Uh, that's a Sankofa moment, y'all. Uh, yeah, yeah. And she, she, is the, she is the founder of, 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 of a college, a university. And, and the reason why, it's not because she started with a whole lot of money. It's because she had the ability to do more with less. And some of us are waiting to go to the other side when we have enough money to get to the other side. But Real faith is when you take what you have and you give it to God. Take what you have. Take the nickels and rub them together and say in the name of Jesus, is there anybody that knows that's when God really works a miracle. Miracles happen when you're willing to take what you have and put it in the master's hand. Can I get at least three witnesses? Is there anybody beside me who said I wasn't I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I wasn't born with a whole lot of money in my pocket, but some how by faith I've been able to make it because God is able when you take the little you have he's able to work a miracle that 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 didn't shout you that didn't shout you some of y'all saying pastor we're in the storm of criminal justice I'm sorry in the storm of criminal injustice What we gonna do? How about a Sankofa moment? We need to look at Truth and Tubman. Y'all know that. Truth, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman. See, what I like about it, that wasn't even their names. They changed their names. See, that's, that's when you exercise authority and power for your own destiny and your own life. You, you don't allow what people call you to be the last word over your life. They change their own name, their own destiny, and they were liberators for their people. I, I, I love about it is that they affirm themselves, but in the service of their liberate, the affirmation, they also had liberation. In other words, they didn't just work for themselves. They worked for the liberation of their people. And I know today somebody's excited about being a jewel and adorning your jewel colors. And I know that there are people here today that are excited about being members of St. Paul church but i'm here to let you know affirm yourself but do something for your people do something to liberate your people when, 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 as long as god gives you life do something to liberate your people y'all ain't gonna say nothing all right i knew that wouldn't shout i knew that wouldn't shout you i knew that wouldn't shout you so uh tubman didn't shout you bethune i didn't uh, shout you um, um, um uh, truth didn't shout okay i got one more that i'm done i'm done I'm, this is my last one if this don't shout you i'll see y'all next week i see y'all next week um I went to the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, and spoiler alert, I'm going to take y'all with me, but I got to tell you this because it works with discernment, and, and they won't allow you to bring a camera, they won't allow you to bring a recording device, so I had to kind of like go back and reflect on the story, but when I first got there, they had, um, they had this area where they had holograms, y'all know what a hologram is? Uh, an image just appears, and it was an image of one of our ancestors, true story, and she started talking to me, real, real life. She started talking to me. She said, she said, here's my story. Go back and get it. Here's my story. 
she said, uh, she said, I was on my way back to the plantation. She said, but by the time I got there, my two sons were gone. The slave traders took them. They were sold out. And she, I didn't even get to see them. I ran down. She was talking to me. She said, I ran down as fast as I could to the harbor because I just wanted to see them and kiss them goodbye one good time. She said, but it was too late. The ship had already started to sail off. And she started crying bitter tears. And there were some white folks there looking at her laughing while she was crying. And she's crying bitter tears. But then her crying shifted and she stopped crying and then she started praying. And when she started praying, she said, Lord, she said, I may never see my boys again. She said, but somehow turn that ship into a ship of liberation and freedom. God, whatever you do, be with my boys. Be with them on board that ship. Six months later, true story, she got a word from the Underground Railroad that her boys were all right. As a matter of fact, here was the message. The boy said, tell my mama this. While we were on board that ship, something happened. A storm came out of nowhere. And a storm devastated the, the ship so much and broke the ship up so much. We were forced to pull in to a port where there was freedom. And because it was a port of freedom, we were able to secure our freedom. Tell our mama the storm set us free. Mama said to, to them, when you go back under the Underground Railroad, go see my sons and tell them it wasn't the storm that set you free, but it was a black woman's prayer that set you free. I'm here to let you know today in the service of liberation, is there anybody that knows we serve a God who's a master of the sea? He can start a storm and he can still a storm. We serve a God who's able to open up doors that no man can close. We serve a God today who's able to work miracles in our world. All he needs us to do is obey him and go to the other side. Do I have any witnesses here today? Is there anybody beside me who made up in your mind that you're going to go where God tells you to go? Even if it means taking some risk all along the way. But when God tells you to go, I made up in my mind. I'm not going by myself. I know that the Lord is with me. Is there anybody that knows that the Lord has been with you? He's been with you through your trials and through your tribulation. And the Lord has been with you through the midnight of the soul. And the Lord has been with you when the doctor said you weren't going to make it. The Lord has been with you when you didn't have any money in your pocket. I just want to know, is there anybody who says I'm not going to trip because of this one storm I've been through some storms before and I made it by the grace of God I dare to just shake a neighbor and say neighbor I'm not going to panic in this storm but I'm going to give God the praise I'm going to give God the glory just cause there's some water in my boat doesn't mean I'm going to give up now do I have anybody with a testimony this morning why don't you look back behind you and shake a neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, I'm looking back just to tell you how good God has been. I'm looking back because I need to encourage somebody. I'm looking back to let you know that I've got history with God and God has been good to me. And since the Lord has been good to me, I've made up my mind. I lost one hour of sleep, but I didn't lose my joy. I lost one hour of sleep, but I didn't lose my praise. I lost one hour of sleep, but I'm still in church today. Just to declare one more time, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I wouldn't be here today. Can I get a witness? Can I get one witness? I dare you to stand up on your feet in the midst of the storm. Look for a miracle. Watch God work. Watch God work. Watch God work. Watch God work. Tell your neighbor, get ready. Get ready. And watch God work. I came to let you know that God is at work in our world. Don't give up on God never gave up on you the God we serve I say the God we serve is at work in our world 
Can you say it? Can you say it? Can you say it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he do it for you? Do I have any elders in the house? Do I have any elders in the house? Have you seen God work? Have you seen God work? With 91 years of age, St. Paul, I want to know, have any elders seen God work? Do I have, do I have any gatekeepers in the house? Do I have any gatekeepers in the house? I need one testimony from the rear of the sanctuary. Have you seen God work? Have you seen God work? Have you seen God make a way? Have you seen God open them doors? Well, I can't get a witness. Can I get a witness from my left? Is there anybody here? You seen God work? Can you testify for a moment? God's not dead, but he's still alive. He's working. Do I have any witnesses here today? Do I have any witnesses here today? Is there anybody here who knows that the God we serve is still on the throne? Is there anybody that knows the God we serve is still making a way? Can you say it? Yeah? Can you say it? Yeah? Can you say it? Yeah? Won't he do it for you? I said, won't he do it for you? Won't he do it for you? Won't he do it for you? Let the redeemed of the Lord one more time. Give him the praise. Give him the praise. The doors of the church are open.